Today we're going to start a great experiment in the history of uh, public access cable. I'm going to re start reading a complete novel and we'll see if uh, you the audience have the guts to stick it through. Uh, we won't uh, we won't do it every week but I know you'll be like the serials you used to see at the uh, when you were a kid if you're 70 years old now you'll be looking forward to the next episode who knows when it will come maybe you won't be anyway uh, this is a book called the Fox and uh, the book is looking for a publisher and the book was written by a member of the 1960s rock group the Fugs and it's sort of a fictionalized version of uh, the group's bizarre entertaining and educational experiences it opens uh, with coffee house readings on the Lower East Side in the early 60s. Then it goes to the Fuck's first performances, their first uh, travel tour across country by minibus, to the Summer of Love, San Francisco. There were chapters on London, German, Scandinavia, Canadian experiences, peace movement confrontations in Washington at the Pentagon, Chicago, the 68 convention where, uh, where the we're forming the foundation for that spurious trial of Abby and uh, seven other people in Wisconsin, New York, and it wanders all over the place. Sketches of TV interviews, press abominatio, college life, and the inside story of the rock business. And it concludes the novel does uh, with the end of the Vietnam War. The war Vietnam War has ended, has it? Yeah, or is it still going on in, in Haiti or what? In Rwanda, I think. An unusual feature of the work will be the inclusion of real artifacts and works of art, photographs, posters, throwaway, leaflets, songs, poems, movie scripts, plays of the protagonist, either in the text itself or as illustrations. So uh, here's chapter one of the Fox. It's, the chapter is called East is Yeast, and it uh, starts in the Lower East Side in a coffee house. Mel Weisterd finished with a short burst of boring aphorisms and sat down to a mild outcropping of applause. Mostly up front where it was unavoidable. Very little from the hazy back where the audience was unobserved and in almost complete darkness. Yuri, that's why you are I. He's the, one of the main characters. Yuri's hot pit pattered. He was next. Then Alex Rayburn announced in a semi-hysterical high, ironically pitched voice, our next reader, a very special guest just in from the coast, the ever popular Peter Mogul. Shit, thought Yuri. I'm all set and that schmuck walks in and gets placed just like that. Yuri had casually maneuvered himself into getting onto the poet's list just at about the three-quarters mark where the audience was best warmed up and mellowing yet not too late too tired or even g dash deep forbid starting to drift out that pompous self-effacing putz just nonchalantly gets himself the best spot as always said Peter, uh, Yuri. He smiled pleasantly to Mogul, but uh, Peter didn't notice. Mogul took the podium and asked for less light over himself, please, and began a long tirade against the United States Steel Corporation and their involvement in the manufacture of syringes for shooting heroin. Yuri suddenly flashed back on how during World War II, one, two, two, three, four, what are we fighting for? World War II, a Shachmanite Trotskyite had finally proved the economic nature of the war to him by the fact that cases of soap made of rendered Jews had just been found in occupied Greece. And by the way, that was, uh, and that has never been proven. I mean, the Nazis were bad enough. They didn't have time to make soap, to use soap. Mogul then began shaking and in a deep cantorial voice sang 12 complete mantras accompanied on the ringing handbells by his sidekick and reputed wife, Ethan Gallo. 
He prefaced each mantra with an explanation and partial translation from the Nepalese, having only recently returned from a three-year sojourn on the subcontinent. After the eighth mantra, some members of the audience were getting a little restless and again began trying to order coffee in voices louder and coarser than usual. Mogul ended with a long scream and wiping the sweat from his thick black glasses received a thunderous ovation. The lights went up and the two young waitresses descended from behind the enormous espresso machine like two official hospital orderlies and began taking orders amidst an exciting cacophonous hubbub. Many people left once the star had read and Brutus Rappaport, the muscular proprietor, let more people in. He had been a karate instructor in the Air Force, and upon release from the service three years ago, a Korea veteran, he had opened his bistro, as he called it, on 2nd Avenue Saint, near St. Saint Mark's M-A-R-X place, in the heart of the new burgeoning, quote, East Village. The place floundered for a while, but then his wife, Kate, a local girl conceived of the idea of inviting the poets in to read every Wednesday night. It soon became one of the most popular places, and together with the used furniture and books they sold, everything you sat on was for sale, and a thriving booking business, Brutus was able to conjure up with the help of his wife's uncle, that, uh, that is the, the bookie business his uh, wife's uncle helped him with, the place was soon bringing in a tidy sum, even though, as Brutus said, there were a bunch of deadheads, too, who never ordered anything but coffee for 25 cents. The poetic reputation of the place brought in uptowners and Brooklynites all during the week, and when someone like Mogul read, if it was known beforehand, as it obviously was somehow tonight, the place was so packed that it was S-R-O with people lining up outside even in all sorts of weather. Yuri ordered a coffee latte and cursed his luck. He noticed that the place was no longer full. Mogul himself was now leaving, not waiting to hear him, of course, and taking with him a large coterie of hangers-on, or tuchus leckers, ass lickers, as Yuri so delicately put it. Bill Soros, the extraordinary author of Short Hair Cook, whom Yuri had hoped would hear his new poem with its special references to his, Bill Soros' latest work, left with Peter. Four women also left, including a blonde that Yuri had exchanged sarcasms with at the beginning of the evening. Ah, fuck them all, he thought. Tonight, I sing for my muse alone. Alex called the crowd to order and he, and he introduced him as the inatimable Yuri Yankovic. And he was on. He walked to the podium. Tonight, I think I'll only do two poems. He waved his hands in imaginary protest. No, that's all I feel like doing. And he began reading When a Bird in a timid, quavering voice, building and building as the audience began to laugh. <laughs> 